Greetings, everybody, and welcome to a very important definitive analysis where we actually tackle uh, some Shakespeare, uh, which I have done through other lectures in the past a little bit with Hamlet, but uh, never on the definitive analysis uh, series, and pretty excited to do this. Um, one thing that prompted my excitement, and I'll keep it super brief because I know these are, you know, these can be long pieces. I'll just be covering <clears throat> Act One today uh, with Romeo and Juliet. Um, I ran into somebody recently who took some classes at Moore Park College where I teach and, um, you know, said as a student in that class where they covered lots of Shakespeare, uh, lots of Shakespeare, she said she walked away with not that much of an understanding of this text and I think that's a pity. Uh, mainly because there's so much here. It's an engaging story. It's a story about young people, which we inherently love in our culture, right? We love stories about the uh, about the youth, uh, perhaps even more about middle-aged or elderly people, right, as kind of the protagonists of the pieces. Um, there's so much here, so much to take away, so much to discuss, right, and share our opinions on. Uh, so I'll get right into it, right? Um, I know as I just covered this with my ninth graders in the second semester of last year, uh, we did a really good job with this. And one thing I want to say right quickly before we get going is I think when it comes to Shakespeare, um, your understanding is only as good as the text aids that are provided. Um, and, and that can drastically vary from book to book. Uh, I know the ones that we have in my high school give quite a little. A uh, bit of information, references, uh, translations, idiomatic translations, whatever it needs to be. Uh, here's the Barnes and Noble. Go Barnes and Noble. This one is robust, uh, and I think once you put together the background, the um, allusions that it kind of provides, right, all of those references, and then you start to put it together with kind of you know keen analytical thinking, uh, you really start to see uh, the major themes of this uh, play. Uh, surface. So let's get into it. I'm just going to whip through the prologue. Now, what I love about the prologue is it's a spoiler, right? It's a giant spoiler in a very general sense, but it's actually quite detailed as well. It kind of gives us some overarching understanding of, uh, of some of the themes. So we start with line three uh, in the prologue, which speaks uh, about this new mutiny. And mutiny, <clears throat> I think, is a good word to use because it reminds us of the denial of authority, the resist, you know, the going against of an authority of some kind, right? I know as a kid when I learned the word mutiny, I guess it's its most literal sense. Uh, it's like the, 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 the crewman on a ship uh, taking over the boat and, and, ta and throwing out the captain, right? The one bestowed with all of this authority. Um, so that's interesting, right? One of the major themes we have in this story, and it speaks to multiple levels, we'll get into it uh, over the course of these uh, uh, lectures, um, is uh, the uh, uh, going against authority, right? In all of its different shapes and forms, uh, whether it be parents, which is always so fun, uh, or God uh, itself, right? There's all kinds of authority that we can uh, rebel against. Um, the other thing I want to point out is line eight, doth with their death bury their parents' strife. We are told from a, a very kind of uh, big narrative stance here, the prologue, that even though they will die, these two young people, it will bury their parents' strife or hatred for one another. Now, will it erase all of the other issues uh, that will come across? I don't know, but it will help to deteriorate that anger and that hatred they have, right? So in a way, though it's horrible to lose any life, these young, ch uh, these young adults here, um, at least it will uh, stop the feud, right? Stop the hatred of the feud. Uh, and it, lastly, it says, uh, line 11, which bought their children's and not could remove, not meaning nothing. Nothing could get rid of this feud between these two families, except uh, for the loss of these two children. So in a way, if you think of fate, right, so in that respect, it had to happen. We get right into Act 1, Scene 1. And I, I think it's tragic to think that uh, young men wake up every day bent on some kind of aggression and noxious uh, kind of anxiety that they feel toward the world. But it very much uh, could be the case. The door just slid open a little. Uh, it very much could be the case. We're given a couple characters here from the Capulet side of things. Samson and Gregory. <laughs> Gregory, you read through, seems to be a little bit more subdued. Samson, go right to the Bible. I don't know much about the biblical narrative on Samson, but I'm pretty sure it represents the idea of just 
brute physical strength, right, and being stronger than others. And he seems to be preoccupied with that idea. Uh, they both are worried about Montague, young men coming into this public space and rivaling them in terms of hurling insults at each other, uh, puffing out their chest, so to speak. So it's a big competition from the get-go. Guys versus guys. I'm tougher than you. Uh, you can think of what we did as kids uh, once in a while, King of the Hill, right? Where the whole point is to just be tough on top, everybody else trying to tear you down. We start Romeo and Juliet, ironically, with that whole attitude. And I say ironically, ironically because this is supposed to be a story of love and romance and deep-seated longing uh, for each other. And here we just have really angry young men in the beginning. Uh, as said, Gregory's a little bit more subdued. Samson says some harsh things about uh, Montague women and women in general, talking about line 16, 17, throwing the maids to the wall. Um, now, I teach ninth grade, and I think it's common that we teach Romeo and Juliet at ninth grade. Some people, like I was talking about that girl in the beginning, uh, young woman, uh, college as well. Um, but think about the level of aggression and harsh attitudes toward women that we experience literally within the first few pages of this play coming from young men and i ask you think about your world in general when guys talk about girls is it usually in aggressive demeaning ways uh, and i think some of us would unfortunately have to agree with that right this is the way that guys tend to talk um he even talks about cutting off their heads and cutting off their maiden heads which is punning on the word in general but cut off their heads, okay, that's pretty horrible. Maidenheads would actually be, oh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> maidenheads would actually be the hymens on the vagina, right? Uh, a part of the vagina and cutting that off. So we're really talking about like uh, disfiguration, right? And kind of cutting up human genitalia. Uh, again, incredibly harsh. Are they joking? Are they serious? Uh, we can at least say that they are uh, uh, talking in this manner. Um, okay, my naked weapon is out. This is going to be line 31. Uh, this is where we start to see the parallel uh, nature between the actual metal weapon, right? This weapon forged to uh, uh, harm others. And now it's naked, which is also bringing us to the phallic understanding of weapon, which would be the male genitalia, especially in an aggressive state. So I want to set you up for that nice and early for the whole text. Um, a lot of the time when we're talking about somebody holding the sword and the aggression that uh, takes place there, it's also parallel to the aggression of a man wanting sex, right? And we'll see this in Romeo uh, throughout. Is it cushioned and massed in beautiful words and romantic illusion sure but at the end of the day it's still this kind of aggression to get what he wants which is sex right um for these these young men uh, all right samson bites his thumb at the montague men and to bite your th your thumb at somebody nowadays would be like you know very uh directly giving them the middle finger here right this seems to set off a quarrel another thing we notice in romeo and juliet again it pertains to our lives i think uh, uh almost 100 percent is um especially on interpersonal levels with other people around you how do fights normally begin how do physical altercations usually begin uh through through just words stupid words mocking insular words and it leads to these major physical uh, leads to these major physical uh, brawls, right? Uh, and sometimes where lives are lost. In comes Tybalt. And Tybalt's one of those characters, I think, when you first start reading through Romeo and Juliet, it's easy to, to really not have an opinion of him. Um, he has it his way. Uh, he stands by this idea to fight at some point, uh, uh, both Mercutio and Romeo. He stands up for the Capulet name, but that's what I want to focus on early on is how important it is uh, for uh, Capulet, oh, I'm sorry, uh, how important it is for Tybalt to stand by that family name. Will others stand by their family names as steadfast and determined as Tybalt does? So I really want to focus on the determination of Tybalt to stand by the Capulet name. For some of us, we have to ask the uh, opinionated question, obviously. How important is family, right? Is it something to be discarded in exchange for something equally as important, such as a spouse, 
uh, or a friend or some activity or do we always stand by our family blood is thicker than water so that's a, a very much an, a question for your opinion now we also notice that the citizens get stuck in the middle and uh, uh, they have their lives uh, imposed upon because of this ongoing brawl. The citizens don't nearly have, some may, but most don't have the kind of money that the Capulets and the Montagues have, being the, the absolute richest families uh, in this town of Verona. Uh, so their more poultry lives uh, are upset by these two very rich families. And again, does that pertain to ideas nowadays uh, where we find that the richest the most elite uh, uh, peoples are, uh, amongst us um, are very frivolous with their behaviors and actually in, in cause harm on other uh, people, right? People below them uh, within some socioeconomic structure. Uh, I love this little part. Um, we don't get too much when it comes to Montague and Capulet, the actual fathers of this family. Montague, very little. Capulet, there's some. There's quite a bit actually with Juliet. But one thing they both share here in common, which is so well done, I think, on behalf of Shakespeare, is they both want to grab these old swords. And some of these swords, especially like a long sword, is a very dated sword. Uh, at this point in time in uh, Veronese uh, uh, history here in Italy, uh, they would be using rapiers. You see the young men in this are fighting with rapier and dagger, uh, which is the more uh, uh, updated modern way of fighting so they're grabbing these long swords that don't work anymore and they can barely wield them right and they're like oh I gotta get out there and, and use this thing again a metaphor for the male genitalia right feeling that you have to keep some vitality to it uh, ongoing uh, into the future here when literally it has no purpose any longer. You'll see this with Capulet when we get to the party scene. He's very flirtatious, trying to live out the olden days, almost to keep this sword in the air. Remember the parallel between physical fighting and a man's aggressive pursuance of a young woman, right, or any woman uh, for that matter. It's all the same aggression and assertion. It speaks to some disposition of man. Uh, okay, very good. Central authority walks into the scene. Um, I want to talk about authority really quickly because it's a major theme is this denial of resistance or going against authority in our lives. It's, it's multi-tiered. The top, top, top would be your authority to God, right? That would be your top. Below that would be, especially in this time period, I always have to remind students whether it's Shakespearean times or whether it's in Verona, Italy, when the play is actually set, we're talking about extremely religious times. Uh, way more religious than we even have today, uh, unless you're somebody who strictly kind of follows the practice, right, and, and the dogma. Um, so the top authority would be God, right? Below that, it would be parents. Uh, guardians, people who have that authority in our lives. Um, below that, uh, I guess uh, it could really uh, alter maybe brothers, sisters, especially when we get into older brothers and sisters when we look at other cultures. But there's always going to be this level of authority, right? We ask ourselves, what kinds of authority is Julia and Romeo opposing throughout this text? Uh, and some probably easily come to mind, some maybe not. But here's the prince. He is our central authority, right? He's sick of all of this uh, destruction. It's happened more than once here, right? And so he creates a consequence. He creates a rule, if you will. Your lives, this is line uh, 91, your lives shall pay the forfeit uh, of the peace. If there is no peace, and this happens again, right? Innocent people uh, uh, being harmed, being put out because of this feud, uh, then lives will start to be lost, right? Is what he's saying here. Uh, Benvolio, uh, early on in this uh, play, definitely relays information. Oh, I saw it. I was there. I'm gonna, I'm gonna share out on that. Um, and of course, a lot of people, Lady Capulet herself, will say, "Well, you're just a, you're a Montague. Why would you tell the truth?" But he does tell the truth here, and I think this is important. Um, in the altercation that begins here, we know Tybalt steps onto the scene and uh, makes a little bit of a show. But it, but it is only a show. Nobody is harmed in the process. And I want to read 105 and 106. Um, he swung about his head and cut the wind. So he was doing a lot of sh uh, kind of showmanship, right? Uh, who nothing hurt withal hissed him in scorn, meaning he didn't hurt anybody. 
he was definitely kind of showing his prowess, I guess you could say, and having uh, some, some fun, but he didn't hurt anybody. And I think that's important to note here. He's not breaking any of the rules. We go all the way to Father Montague. Like I said, he's barely in this play, but he is right here in scene one. And he's talking about his son and the state that he has seen his son in sadness despair however the way he describes him is more like a greek deity and there we run into you know nice and clear here uh the biggest theme going in this whole play which is idolatry worshiping something else rather than the one true god again remember the very religious times that shakespeare's writing plus this play actually takes place in italy um and here, it, it, what is, what's the easiest way to contradict this idea of godly rule? Um, just go to the Greeks and the Romans who believed in multiple gods, who believed in more Hellenistic ideas, meaning uh, the human mind, the human body, to elevate to get to God, whereas the Hebraistic is to, which we find here, is to completely cover that, right? Even when you look at renditions of Romeo and Juliet theatrically, uh, you notice that Juliet's covering her hair. Uh, it's not just kind of freely out uh, like we are accustomed to, and that's to show the more Hebraistic culture of the time, right? Decency, modesty, covering things up, uh, especially for the upper class who could, in, in a sense, afford to uh, kind of live this way and abide by these rules. Um, so, yeah, just to point that out, um, Romeo is about to get described like a Greek god. I'll read a couple lines here, right? Um, this is line 129, 130. Should in the farthest east begin to draw the shady curtains from Aurora's bed, which takes us to uh, the Roman goddess of the dawn. So tying us into Roman mythology, which is directly opposing uh, a Christian and Catholic, uh, a Catholic dogma, right? That's starting to have this establishment in the world. Um, and here's another very a couple important lines. And private, this is lines 133, 134, and private in the chamber, pens himself, shuts up the windows, locks fair daylight out. Daylight, light in general, especially this harsh, kind of clear light, is going to be metaphorical for God, right? That one true God. Um, and notice, what is Romeo doing? He's shutting it out. He is shutting out God, and within his room, he has created what his father calls an artificial night. And night usually, within a kind of a dogmatic religious interpretation, usually is negative, right? Nighttime, even the moon, uh, usually has negative connotations, right? So right away, describing Romeo like a Greek deity, which seems to set us on this path of idolatry, right? This big sin uh, against God. And what happens to people who sin? Right, we've got a lot of sins in this book, including suicide. There's a lot of them, but you could take this attitude, what happens to people who sin against God? They get their just desserts, right? Uh, maybe varying on how bad the sin was. There'll be other sins to account for as well. All right. Benvolio catches up with Romeo. They're trying to find out what's going on. Uh, and one of the first things that Romeo says, this is line 158, not having that which having makes them short. And I just want to focus on one word here because it brings us to another major theme. Remember, a lot of themes are established in the first, right, in the first uh, uh, act, right, maybe even in the first scene because it's got to get these things going. Having, right? Why is Romeo upset? Because he didn't have something. And this gets into the idea of like, do you want it? Do you need it? Do you really need that thing? Or is it uh, something uh, that you just want, right? And that's more the obsession that you're dealing with. And that's kind of where Romeo is at. He wants love. He wants a woman to return his affections. Maybe he wants his affections to be recognized, to actually have an effect on a woman, right? And he's, he doesn't have that. But I want to take a kind of a, a step over here and just think about the common notion of the haves versus the have-nots, which is the, rich, the, the very rich versus you know, the very poor. Uh, some people have, some people have not. Romeo and Juliet, and all these people, for the most part, that the play focuses on, which is common in Shakespeare's texts, are the haves, right? They have everything, everything you could ever want. Richest families in town, right? We will get a lot of examples also of have-nots, right? Minor characters here and there. But maybe that's what this is all starting from, is I want something, I want to have it, but I can't. 
uh, and it's the haves versus the have-nots, uh, kind of the, the, the drive that starts to build around that idea, right? We start to get into this contradictory uh, language early on that expresses um, a uncertainty of who people are, right? Uh, for instance, this is line 173, um, couple, actually line 172, 173, serious vanity is, off, uh, is obviously in a way uh, very um, uh, oxymoronic. We usually don't think vanity, which is kind of problematic because it's indulgence or something like that, uh, as something serious. But maybe that's what our protagonists and this play are getting set up for, as a very serious vanity, taking themselves incredibly seriously and not thinking about others, right? So vanity. Um, misshapen chaos of well-seeming forms. Um, when somebody looks or appears or seems one way and then they come across completely differently, right? Uh, and you're taken for a spin. We'll see that theme played upon as well uh, as the play picks up. All right, I've got a marked page here, which is always important. This is so nice. I didn't notice this until last year, really. Uh, and this is going to solidify the parallel between being aggressive in the battlefield as a young man uh, versus um, being aggressive in the pursuance of a woman, right? Chasing a young girl. I want this girl to be mine, right? And I'm gonna do whatever I can to make sure that happens. And, and get what I want from this girl as well, right? I think for Romeo, that's a big part of it. Um, but here we go, this is so important. We're talking about Rosalind, uh, who is not giving in to Romeo's words. She's not giving in uh, to his behavior. She doesn't want anything to do with him, right? She's saying, I'll pass, right? A hard pass. And here's how Romeo puts it. Uh, this is line 202. She'll not, she'll not be hit with Cupid's arrow. Notice he's already, though it is a reference to kind of uh, a Roman illusion um, or, or Greek illusion, whatever it may be. Uh, notice that he's talking about a soldier, right, using bow. She had Dean's wit. That would be the Greek uh, goddess Diana. And she is the goddess of hunt and chastity. So here's that big idea. And if your teachers and professors weren't talking about these things, it's just crazy because I guess we just read things and we don't even know what they're really all about. You don't really know the ideas and the topics and the themes that are supposed to be in discussion. I don't know what kind of process that must be. Um, but we keep going here. So she, she has Dean's which she has chased. She's not just going to give herself over sexually or otherwise uh, to my advances. And in strong proofs of chastity, well armed. We're back to soldiers, right? Don't forget the beginning of this play, these young men all mad, uh, trying to best each other with words and physical kind of acts. Um, this girl is well armed, so we're getting back to that idea of soldier. This is where we start to blur the line for Juliet, especially, mainly, uh, of who is the real soldier in this story? Is it going to be stereotypically the man? Or is it, which Shakespeare does a lot, wonderfully, beautifully, is it going to be Juliet? Will Juliet play more of a soldierly, strong-willed, defensive type of individual? We'll have to wait and see. Check out all these war-like words that are used here. Battle-like words. Here we go. Um, she will not stay the siege of loving terms. Um, if you know what a siege is, that's when they basically try to like surround either a, a, a city or a fortress and wait it out, right? Starve it out, uh, which can be a really devastating affair. Um, she will not stay the siege of loving terms. So she won't just let me spit game at her all day long, right? And go for it. Like, oh, you're so beautiful. I've never seen anyone like you before, right? Da, 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 da. And he's got a much more romantic way of putting it. But she doesn't care about that stuff. Stay the siege of loving terms. Beautiful. Nor bide the encounter of assailing eyes. What else doesn't she stand for, Rosalind? Uh, this character who denies Romeo and causes him so much anguish here in the beginning of the play. Um, she doesn't let him look at her. She doesn't let him gawk at her and look at her up and down like, dang, wow, right? She doesn't stand for that. Uh, last one, nor open her lap to saint seducing gold. Or if you don't, actually, she's not just going to uh, put the expression put out for money, right? She's not just going to, uh, you know, engage in those types of acts because you just have a lot of money. Um, this sounds like every parent's dream, 
right, in terms of a daughter or a son. Somebody who's going to have this integrity. Uh, and I really want to highlight that early on here because I think a lot of us just breeze over these characters. It's more like plot focused for, for so many people. But what she stands for, Rosalind, right, she is a defensive combatant who will not be uh, defeated by all of these things that Romeo is talking about here. Right? So it's pretty amazing. Tying us to the idea of soldier. We move on. Romeo's attitude is questionable. Uh, and he says, line uh, 2, uh, 12, she hath, and in that sparing makes huge waste. Because she's not giving me what I want, which we can already understand, this is Romeo, it's, it's romance, sure, but it's also sexual desire. That's what's driving Romeo forward when it comes to Rosalind uh, and obviously when it comes to Juliet as well. And what he says is because she's not reciprocating in this way, it's a huge waste. And think about Romeo as a young man saying that it's a waste that she doesn't do this, as if she has no other value, right? So I think we can be highly critical of Romeo here and the type of attitude uh, that he has early on here. Benvolio's advice to Romeo, examine other beauties, examine other beauties. Uh, keep on looking, you'll find somebody prettier than Romeo, or prettier than uh, uh, Rosalind. Another big theme here, so many themes, right? And we're not even out, we're just out of scene one, uh, is the only thing that matters is physical appearance. The only thing that matters is physical appearance. And I'll leave that up to you if you think that's a true sentiment uh, about the world or not. Scene two introduces us to Paris, all right? Um, young suitor, uh, it just makes sense. Uh, I don't wanna get into the, you know, the pros and cons of arranged marriages, but let's be clear here, write it down. You have an arranged marriage, right? Whether you like the concept or not. Um, you, that's what I love about this book. It gives a lot of background on the time period, um, the courtship, especially for wealthy families that would take place. And Paris is by the book with all of this. He's wealthy, he's established, he is relatives to the prince. So he's got that nice backing, kind of that neutral party here that we have in the play. Um, he is a little pushy, right? He's a little pushy, thinking that Juliet should be ready. Uh, Lady Capulet will be a little pushy here. Uh, uh, ironically, it's going to be Father Capulet who says we need to wait early on. He does say something interesting in Act 1, Scene 2, uh, line 14. Earth had swallowed all my hopes but she, meaning we've had other children. Juliet is the only surviving child that we have. We've had to bury other children. I love the way Shakespeare works, and I speak in full totality of the text because basically the prologues kind of already do that. We know what happened. Where is Juliet's final resting place in this play? The tomb. So it will not just be the previous children that Earth swallows up. It will be Juliet as well. And we kind of get some early foreshadowing here in the language. Um, talking about Lusty. Uh, in line, I believe it is, 26. Such comfort as do lusty young men feel. Um, so another, you know, uh, uh, um, I guess you could say... Uh, confusing, right, and uh, distracting uh, thing that young men and women experience is lust, right, which speaks to physical passion, right? I want what I see, right? I, that, that's what I, I uh, 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 it speaks to the physical need, right? So there's another thing that Capulet seems to acknowledge early in the play, right, is that men are lusty. Men will act upon these impulses, right? It's a part of who we are. Uh, all right, very good. Uh, just to point it out, uh, notice when we get into the serving man who starts with line 38, um, the iambic pentameter, which is utilized uh, throughout this entire play, breaks. And the reason for that, as I've been taught, is the serving man represents a low-class, low-skilled, lowly, educated individual. So that's why they don't speak in the iambic pentameter, which ironically is how the common folk spoke in England, which made it easy for them to follow along with these plays. Uh, so even though the elites within the play, the wealthy, are the ones who have the iambic pentameter, it's really what the common folk would understand. Notice it is also the elites who are speaking most of the play, so they want that language to be recognizable, right? The cadences and the, and the measures and the meters and everything. Uh, okay, very good. Sorry for the phone. All right. Uh, I'm not going to dwell upon this, 
just point out a couple things, but I think Shakespeare is doing something very deep here um, when Romeo reads off the list of guests uh, that we get from the party. All right. Um, you know, we get into the first one. Uh, who's on this, this list? And I think you can honestly do a deep analysis on this. We start with Signor Martino, right? Martino, we're talking about war. Actually, uh, um, uh, gets to Mars, right? When we start talking about Roman deities, Roman uh, ideas. Uh, so we start with war. Notice this play started with war, right? Battling, battling and feuding between these two uh, families. It's amazing, right? So that's the way it starts. Um, County Anselm, uh, uh, Anselm translates to God's helmet. So this idea of maybe uh, um, uh, tying, all right, you know, some kind of protectiveness to God. It's hard to say. That one's a difficult one. But I want to point out the next two, uh, which is line 66, 67. Eutruvio, uh, and we also have Placentio. This really, I think, speaks to mothers, right? Conception, giving birth, uh, uh, conceiving a child, uh, and then uh, 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 developing that child over the course of kind of nine months, right? Our very, our beginnings. There's war, and then what happens? Children are born into and nurtured into a world of war. So we have Eutruvio, which is really the uterus, right? We're speaking of the uterus. Then what do we have? Placentio, which is just connecting us to the placenta, that which nourishes the uterus. Out of there, we start to get some other names here, and I'll, I'll kind of stop there. Uh, Valentine, which is strong and healthy. Capulet, which is determined and headstrong. Maybe this is the type of upbringing within this, I guess you could say, uh, framework, right? War. This is the kind of upbringing uh, we have. Some other names stand out beautifully. Uh, we have Rosalind. We know about Rosalind. She'll be at this party. And then Livia. Livia translates to envy, which is another major theme of this text, right? How we envy other people. Uh, all right, very good. We end with Lucio and Helena, uh, which is light and shining light. So maybe there is some positivity by the time we get to the end of this list, which could speak to the development of our lives here. Who's to say? But I think there's a lot going on with that list. I don't think the names are just completely random. All right, we get into Romeo. Uh, this is line 89. We get into the very clear idolatry of his speech. I'll just read. Uh, when the devout religion of mine eye maintains such falsehood, right, they will essentially become transparent heretics, be burnt for liars. He's saying, if I ever say that anyone is more beautiful than Rosalind, Rosalind, this kind of upstanding, strong-willed, protective young woman, right? Um, if I ever say anyone's more beautiful than her, he basically says, burn me for a liar. Burn me a heretic, right? Somebody who turns against God. And I do think that Rosalind has that kind of station. She has that kind of symbolism and significance. It's tying us to that, that real devoutness, right? And piousness toward God. Uh, whereas so many other things, wealth, physical lust, other things are driving us away from that. And that's what he says. If I say anyone's more beautiful than her, then I got, you know, a lot to account for. And what is he going to say as soon as he goes to this party later on? I have found somebody more beautiful than her, right? And he will essentially turn his back on Rosalind. Is that him early on turning his back on God? I'll let you be the, uh, the judge of that. Rosalind, right? Ah, let me back up. Scratch that. Um, the all-seeing sun, which is God, never saw her match since the first world begun. So uh, I don't think this is necessarily idolatry, kind of what he's mentioning here. He'll get to that. Once we get to Juliet, which translates to youthful, right? So idolizing youthfulness in our lives, which just go check the commercials and the, everything in life. Just go look on YouTube. We, youth worship it worships youth, right? Elderly people worship youth. Middle class worships youth. There's something about youthfulness, right, that is endearing, exciting, attractive, right? So we'll get there. We'll get into Juliet. But here, um, God was on, you know, this idea of Rosalind and devoutness was on par with God when the world first begun. It's taking us back, back to the very beginnings from a creationist standpoint. So these are very important words here. We get to 
uh, Act 1, Scene 3. All right, I'll be quick here. The nurse has a lot to say. The nurse is going to be another character who breaks iambic pentameter due to her uneducated nature. So you can just see that how she does that. And she has, a, I guess she has a, a propensity to ramble, right? Uh, maybe like me too. Um, and I just want to point this out because uh, I didn't know this without the text dates. But it mentions here, part of the understanding here as we read through this is, the nurse has been a much more of a kind of vital motherly figure, parent figure to Juliet than even her parents have been in some ways. While they are rich parents and Juliet has everything she could ever need, emotionally they're not really there. It's even said that they were away on holiday and it was the nurse who was home weaning Juliet off of her breast, right? She was the one uh, doing, like a wet nurse, uh, she was the one doing all that work and really you think about it, I know my wife breastfeed both of our children, the bond that starts to create, be created there. So something to think about. Juliet's parents, when they start telling her things, giving her advice, they, there was times when they weren't quite that involved. The nurse likes to talk a lot about Juliet's virginity, um, how she's getting to that point as every young woman, remember they moved along very early on in this time period, very common as stated in the text, <coughs> women to be married at 13, pregnant at 13, children at 13, 14, 15, right? Um, so very common back in this time period, though it thoroughly throws us off a little bit uh, based on, you know, uh, our current, uh, current time. Um, but really excited for Juliet, a little crude the way she talks about it, right? But she has, she has that uh, tendency, right, to speak very openly about sex, which, when you read the text aids in this book, at least, it says, was very uncommon for adults to speak to children or young teens, right, whatever, uh, young adults. Uh. All right, always nice when the uh, battery on the camera goes out and uh, just picking it right back up uh, from where we are in Act 1, Scene 3. Uh, and last thing I really need to say about this act as Juliet essentially gets kind of primed for the marriage with uh, Paris uh, is... Uh, on line at 81, Lady C goes into this whole thing about how a person is like a, 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 a potential suitor is like a book. There's going to be things you see on the outside and then there's going to be the contents of the inside, right? Uh, and hopefully there's more to learn. So you might be brought in by the appearance and the beautiful bindings and clasps, as they say, on the book. Uh, but then you're going to be able to really find out who the person is on a, on a deeper level. I think we're always thinking about that with Romeo and Juliet, remember this is just a relationship that lasts a mere few days. Um, but we ask, how much are they learning about each other? Is it past just the physicality and what your eyes, what, what appeals to your eyes? Do we get to learn, do they get to learn more about the internal uh, character, right, that they have? Uh, so moving on, we go into Act 1, Scene 4. And this is um, our young men, uh, Montague's uh, as well as Mercutio, who's actually kinsman to the prince as well. So he's kind of tied to that middle ground, that neutral party. Uh, but he's a part of the troop here, and they're getting ready to go to the party. Uh, it's going to be a masked uh, party. Uh, they're going. Uh, obviously, it's against the rules for them to go because they are Montague men. But they're going anyway, so there's a bit of a kind of, you know, uh, suspense there, I guess. Um... Let's see here. Romeo is sad. Romeo is sad because he's still thinking about the rejections of Rosalind, which might have a lot of merit to it, a lot of kind of virtue to it, uh, you know, based on who she is, the way she carries herself. But it's still going to get him down nonetheless, right? Um, and he has these words. This is line uh, 46, or I'm sorry, uh, 48. And he says, I dreamt a dream tonight. And basically what he's saying is he had a dream that was kind of a bad omen, that gave him a bad omen about going to this party and that something bad may come from it. There'll be an, a, a, a negative consequence. Mercutio is quick to tell him that um, dreams don't matter, right? And then he gets into his famous or infamous, I'll leave it up to you, the Queen Map speech. Now, in my opinion, in a nutshell, what is this speech all about? Um, if you look at the early descriptions of Queen Mab, even though being called a queen, she is almost like an insect, right? And, and it takes us into the earth itself, right? The, the spider webs, the insects. Um, but it also kind of takes us closer to the crypt. And I think a lot of the language 
of Romeo and Juliet, but I guess we could say some other characters here too, it continuously leads us into the crypt, right? We're all headed there, almost like we're sleepwalking our whole way through it. Um, and I think this speech does tend to have that kind of effect. Um, what does Queen Mab do? Through this hideousness and the form that she comes into your mind at night as you dream, the wonderful thing is she brings, us your, your, brings you your desires. Um, and this is true of the lover seeking love. They'll dream of love and you know having these awesome experiences. And then to keep that parallel of soldier and lover uh, uh, kind of you know in, may, uh, ingrained in our minds here, notice we go from speaking of lovers in their dreams to soldiers in their dreams. And of course, what do soldiers dream of? What just makes sense? Uh, as he says, cutting foreign throats, right? Enemies' throats. Um, so all dreams are kind of accounted for with, with Queen uh, Mab. And then he calls her a hag at the end. And the last one, lines 90 through 93, are interesting because I think they directly connect to Juliet's circumstances. A young girl, maybe on the, uh, uh, the verge of marriage and love, and of course, this is a Catholic society, so there is no contraception, which means you probably get pregnant very quickly and become a mother. Juliet's mo mother tells us she was 13 uh, when she was already married and had a kid, had Juliet. So this is the norm for the time. Um, however, how do we feel about those circumstances for Juliet? Does that sound, I'll just read the language. This is Queen Mab who, um, when maids lie on their backs, that presses them and learns them first to bear, making them women of good carriage. And making them, uh, you know, pressing them is the idea of a man's body, right? Sexual intercourse and then good carriage. Being a woman of good carriage would be uh, uh, carrying and rearing the offspring that follow, right? Which in this time period and even in Shakespeare's day was probably still one of the most significant aspects of a woman's life was the idea of motherhood, right? Because so many uh, uh, opportunities, unfortunately, were kept from women uh, for the longest of time. Of course, by men, right? Men keeping them from these things. Um, so I don't know how we feel about that fate. Uh, and even Mercutio's speech here, Queen Mab, it allows us to get a bit cynical. It allows us to get a little cynical when we think about that possible outcome for a young woman. Just bear the way to your husband and then just bear the way to the kids, right? Both physically and metaphorically, perhaps. What does Mercutio call dreams? Um, he says they are, line 95, uh, the children of an idle brain. Dreams are children, they're irresponsible, they know no better, and it's all based on just being idle, having nothing better to do with your life if, except sit around and dream, right? And get caught up in these fantasies while the rest of the world is already, they're working, right? They're working to make a living, to put bread on the table at the end of the day, and here you just get to fantasize about all this kind of crazy stuff. Um, you got nothing better to do with your time. I'd ask you if you agree with that. Does Romeo sound like somebody who makes a big deal about love and romance mainly because he's like a rich kid with nothing better to do. I'll leave that up to you. Romeo again, uh, lines 105, 106, he has a bad feeling about going to this party. Um, and obviously it, that's kind of a valid ominous feeling that he has here because we know what's going to be the trajectory and the outcome of all of this. It's a disaster, right? It's the tragedy of Romeo and Juliet. At the very end here, line 111, on lusty gentlemen, right? Onward with lust as we go to this party. It speaks to the physicality, right? The parts of our, ourselves that are hard to control, right? And lead to temptation and can lead to other things as well. Lastly, what I really just want to emphasize here as we leave this scene is the stage direction. They march about the stage and exit. March just like soldiers, right? The parallel between going to fight another man in some kind of combat, but also, I keep mentioning the aggression, the assertion it would take to go and conquer a woman in terms of using words, in terms of using gestures, right? Hey, did that move work on her? Did that line work on her? You know, just to speak like some typical, let's say, stereotypical guy there. We have strategies, women too, of course. Um, we have strategies, right, uh, that we try to employ in order to get what we want here. All right, so just like soldiers, they're off to this party. Act one, scene five. You know, we talk about people who don't have that idle time 
And Shakespeare makes sure to represent these people, and they usually come in the beginnings and ends of scenes, and it's the serving men. Uh, the people without education who have these subservient positions to these elites, right, both families. Uh, we're really only brought into the Capulet home. We are not brought into the Montague home uh, at all uh, throughout the play. But here they are. These are people with uh, work to do, right? Uh, they don't have time for romance and uh, uh, compelling affairs, right? They're, they're just serving food. Uh, all right, very good. Uh, second serving man sets us up for a nice example. Second serving man says, this is lines uh, three and four, when good manners shall lie all in one or two men's hands and they unwash too, tis a foul thing. When the representation and standard of what manners are within a given culture and society are set by only a few people, in this case, in our case too, the rich, the elites, we always look to the rich for refinement and sophistication and how to behave, right? And what this serving man is saying is profound, right? And I love how Shakespeare can give some of the most profound statements, thematic understanding to us as readers through uh, the uh, subservient uh, characters that we have here, right? The uneducated. Hmm. Well, maybe uneducated in terms of words and Greek and Roman allusions, but educated in the moral and ethical sense, to be sure, right? Here it is. What happens when our best examples of what decency is and refinement is, um, it says they are unwashed too, then we're all screwed, right? If that's our, our, our shining star of what it means to be a good person within our society. And look no further than the example that's provided two seconds later, it's going to be Lord Capulet, Father Capulet. Um, we find out right away, lines 21 and 22, that he, had a, he has a very flirtatious past. Uh, past. He would always, as it says, uh, a whispering tale in a fair lady's ear. For our intents and purposes, he could successfully spit game, right, uh, to uh, young ladies during, uh, really throughout his life. It sounds like this is something that he uh, has put a lot of time, effort, and seriousness into, right? And he, he's pleasured by his remembrances of it. Uh, so we learn this background. I think as readers, it's easy to gloss over anything, a lot of stuff in this book that's not directly related to Romeo and Juliet. We miss the characterization provided. Uh, we miss the exposition provided. Um, Father Capulet is a sinful man, right? If we start to look at it that way, when it comes to his uh, sexual desire um, and adulterousness. We find out later in a comment, quick comment from Lady Capulet, that he's always been this type of person. And what's nice to see in some of the theatrical versions that you'll watch too is this is, uh, this is a detail that's represented, right? He's just kind of all over the place grabbing girls on their rear. I forget which one at that moment, the Zeffirelli one. So they're really showing this side of him, okay? Um, it gets so bad in terms of a religious undertone, I would say, on line 26, the room has grown too hot. We have to quench the fire. That literal heat is going to be hellishness, uh, sinfulness, right? All swelling up in this room here in the nighttime. Of course, in the nighttime, because the daytime hours are the hours of God and clarity, right? Uh, that presence, that judgment here, the nighttime is, is really always seen in kind of religious uh, uh, thinking is, is a, a negative time, a time for... Uh, um, uh, a lack of control, I guess you could say. So the room has grown too hot. Well, that makes sense because of the sinfulness this party represents. They even mentioned Pentecost, line 24. My, you know, I would interpret that as uh, maybe a physical, what it is, a physical manifestation of God's power. Maybe that's what happens uh, when we talk about the fate of Romeo and Juliet, right? The outcome. Maybe this is, this was God's judgment manifesting a kind of uh, decision using real people in real life, right? Manifesting that, that here on earth. All right. All right. Here's where Romeo starts to get into that speech that uh, shows us the idolatry, right? The words that express his idolatry based on Juliet here. He is free, kind of giving up on the one true God and finding his priority elsewhere. Um, he even says, she, when he first sees her, no, it's, notice it's all sight, right? It's always based on sight. Uh, as a rich jewel in an Ethiop's ear, to give it that kind of exoticness. Uh, beauty too rich for use for earth too dear, right? 
too dear for earth. To say that any human being, any human being is too good or too dear for earth is idolatry. Because at the end of the day, we are human beings. We are meant for this swamp, right? For this earth. And to say something else would put us on a level with God, right? Or some deity uh, that is much closer to that than a human being could ever be. Again, from a, a kind of religious creationist standpoint, right? Um, so just wanted to express that. Uh, you can start to see the idolatry here. More importantly, lines 50 and 51, more importantly, uh, this is where we see uh, him basically become the heretic that he spoke of earlier. He said he would never see anything as mo uh, anyone more beautiful, anything more beautiful than Rosalind. What does he say right here? Uh, 50 and 51, forswear at sight, for I never saw true beauty till this night. He's seen it. Now he's seen real beauty, which means if he's living by that kind of verdict he gave either, he's now a heretic. He's now turned from God. Notice it's the sight, forswear at sight. It's what he is seeing that is compelling him to now follow this new direction. Juliet, and what is he following? Just look at the name itself. It makes perfect sense. He's following youth, the beauty of youth, because beauty looks so good. Or I'm sorry, youth looks so good, right? Um, okay, very good. Tibble, easy to look over this Tibble stuff, I believe. To strike him dead, I hold it not a sin. Um, to strike him dead, I hold it not a sin. The word sin is very important here because we just uh, are, you know, got done talking about idolatry, right? A judgment of God, um, a God that a judgment that supersedes all other judgments, right? And so what Tybalt says is, here's Romeo. He's not supposed to be here. If I were to kill him, um, I would not see it as a sin. I would not worry about some kind of judgment here. And it's all to protect the family name, right? You see how important that is to Tybalt, protecting the Capulet uh, uh, kind of family here, right? From intermixing with these known enemies. Remember, he's born into this. We go back to that party list. He's born into this. So somebody who's born into a conflict and a feud like this, uh, where you've never even seen it any other way, you're just doing what you've been told to do. And Tybalt does a darn good job of that, right? protecting that family name, not letting this intermixing take place. Even if it's something like love or romance, it's not going to, ha it's not going to happen. Right? He lives by a certain principle. My question for you as uh, readers here, do you see that as honorable? Is Tybalt honorable in this respect? Uh, how important is family in your opinion? Um, some of us leave family behind or minimize our kind of uh, relationships with family for a spouse or for something else or for, you know, whatever, an interest or a hobby. Some of us, blood is thicker than water, right? Uh, so I'll leave that up to you, how you perceive Tybalt here. Now, a lot of idolatry taking place, you know, really lines 90 all the way down. Uh, Romeo starting with, uh, it is line 92, I believe, the gentle sin, they're toying with the word sin. Notice his sin is kind of based on this idea of uh, getting Juliet, uh, Tybalt's consideration of sin a moment ago was protecting all this from happening. So in a way, maybe they're thinking, they're th they might be thinking the same thing. But the gentle sin is this, my lips, two blushing pilgrims ready sp uh, stand to smooth that rough, titch, uh, rough touch with a tender kiss. So likening his lips to pilgrims, followers of a religion. Um, I guess it was common to intertwine language of love and sentiments of love with religious kind of language as well back in the day. But maybe this is more along the lines of idolatry, right? Uh, mixing the two worlds a bit too much, right? Uh, at least too much for comfort. Juliet corrects him, right? Um, she says that uh, saints uh, use their lips, absolutely, but um, it's going to be in, in prayer, right? And Romeo, what does he want to do instead of pray? He wants to kiss, which seems to oppose the notion of praying, right? Two, two very different uh, uh, actions.
Romeo seems to kind of probably take more of the initiative here because Juliet holds back, though she is quite inviting if you start to look at the language. Um, give me my sin again, and they kiss. And boy, does this seem to kind of seal the deal. I think, again, if we read too quickly here, we, we forget to think about what Juliet must be feeling as a young 13, 13, not even 14. She's still got a couple weeks. She never makes it to her 14th birthday. So we shed massive tears there. Um, but, you know, think about it. Your first kiss, um, not a lot of people to talk about it with. It's all just you going through this. I think it's just good to slow down and think about what she's going through here a little bit. Juliet makes the comment after she finds out. Um, she, she wants to know who this guy is. She doesn't quite know the name of Romeo uh, as he leaves the party. Um, and she says, oh my gosh, if he's a Montague, and the line is 133, my grave is like to be my wedding bed. And this is, I guess, pretty constant. I think you even see it with um, um, Hamlet to some degree. Uh, when we talk about like weddings and funerals, here we have the same thing. We have a wedding and a funeral, right? Uh, and what she's saying is if he's a Montague, then my grave is going to be my wedding bed because I will never get married. I will be married to death. And it's good for me to say that once or twice. The idea of Juliet being married to a personified death because it, it's, it's, it's referenced a lot throughout this play, right? I will marry death. I will be wed to death, right? Um, which maybe is, is more of a presence throughout the play, um, even more than Romeo as a, as a real kind of direct presence in her life, this idea of death, and if I don't have him. So that's the way she's already thinking. If it's, if it's going to be a problem here and I can't be with this man and something's stopping that, I'm just going to die all by myself, right? She finds out it is a Montague, right? Her loathed enemy. And um, that's the way uh, this first act ends. So there's a lot uh, going on in uh, Act 1. I think it's long because it has to establish a lot of different things. Uh, uh, thank you for listening, and I'll see you for Act 2 next time.